All right, I love all the, oh, be careful, little man. Woo. All right, I love all the summer clothes. Everybody having fun? Yeah, are we tired from school? Man, it looks that way. That's all right. Oh, well, good morning. Well, good morning, boys and girls. I'm so glad that you came up to talk with me a little bit. Now, I'm going to be talking with your parents in just a little while about, about some exciting things that happen in their life. But I want to ask you if you can, I know this is a big task I'm going to ask you, but if you could think back to the most exciting time in your life. Does anyone share maybe something that happened or something you did that was the most exciting thing that's ever happened to you that you were like, whoa. Yeah, go ahead. Yesterday. Man, mom and dad did it right. It was your birthday party, wasn't it? And did it just blow your mind? Okay, we're really glad to hear that. All right, good job, mom and dad. Okay, yes. Go ahead. <laughs> That'll do it. Yes, the Bahamas. Yes. Your first home run. Well, I've never experienced that, so good on you, man. All right. <laughs> yes, sir. I was waiting for Disney World. Yes, very good. Yes, there's all these things that we do that are really exciting. And, but maybe the home run, you didn't know what was coming, but maybe on your trip to the Bahamas or the birthday party that was coming up, were you all getting like really excited the days before and then you were there and it was really excited and woo, you had fun, it was great. But then all that excitement, you're up here, energy is high, but then all of a sudden maybe the vacation's over and the home run kind of fades away from your memory. And do you guys ever feel that? That maybe like, huh, that's over. And maybe you felt a little sad that it was over. Have you guys ever felt that way before? Well, good, I'm not alone. Phew, I'm glad. Yes, there's been some exciting times in my life. And there's been moments when, there, one of the exciting times in my life is when I said yes to Jesus. When I said, Jesus, I want you to be my forever friend. Remember Pastor Frank or Bishop Frank would say that? Jesus, I want you to be my forever friend. And when I called Jesus in my heart, I felt like I was on top of the world. Woohoo! That life was great. But then sometimes tougher stuff happens in life and we feel sad. And the, the story that I want to share with you today is that in the Bible, there's mountaintop experiences where God is literally present and it's all great, but then God goes away and then kind of tough stuff happens. But even in the midst of, of being sad, maybe. God is with us, and God, God blesses us, and God will continue to be with us until that next exciting time. So, my friends, the next time you have an exciting time, maybe when you get done with the birthday party or hitting the home run or going on a trip or experiencing some, uh, maybe you say yes to Jesus and you feel really excited after all that, and maybe you feel a little sad, number one, know that that's kind of normal, that that happens, and that's okay because it was really fun and you're sad that it was over, and that's, that's good. But remember, even in that sadness, which I'm going to talk to your parents, I'm going to call it the valley, right? When you're really sad in the valley. God is with you, God loves you, and God will take care of you. Now, friends, you were such good listeners, and if you want to go to Children's Church, we'll go in just a minute. But I'm going to pray for you. I know we do a lot of repeat prayers, but if you will, will you put your hands together like this and then just bow your heads for me? I'm going to pray for you all, okay? Dear God, I pray for all these children and, and young, young kiddos that are before me, Lord. I pray that you would bless them, that you'd keep them, that you'd continue to help them to grow in their faith. And as their bodies continue to grow, Lord, just continue to be with them, strengthen them. I pray for their families, Lord, and I pray that in those times when they're sad, when things come about that just is tough, Lord, I pray that you would keep these, these innocent and beautiful children, Lord, in your hands, and that you would just let them know of your love and your care. It's in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. All right, boys and girls, you were great listeners. As always, you can go back with Miss Katie. There she is. Or you guys can go back to your parents. Good morning. Well, if you've heard me preach before, you've heard these words from me before. Um, my name is Billy Nickran. I'm the associate pastor here on staff, and I say these words. It is truly a pleasure and honor to be standing before you, and I do not take that lightly. I know that I feel I have a calling in my life to preach the good news and to be present this day and to be honored to share the good news. Uh, is such a privilege, and I hope you all know that. And i got to be honest, I'm really sad. I know the Olympics are over, but I had to listen to Katy Perry one more time. Who knew that I would actually like that song, Katy Perry singing a song? But I I'm really excited about that summer bumper, and I'm sad to see it go. And I'll leave it alone. I'll leave it alone. So today, uh, we're finishing up our sermon series, Living the Olympic Life. And I'm going to be talking about After the Confetti Falls. 
and I'll get into that in just a moment. And we, I started out this sermon series a few weeks ago about dealing with fear. And I challenge you all to not let fear grab a hold of you, but to put your trust in God. And then our interim pastor, uh, Greg McGarvey, came in. And he talked about that great cloud of witness that comes alongside us, that helps us, even in the midst of our hardest times. And then if you were blessed to be in worship last week as I was, Cindy Riddle, our uh, uh, assistant to the bishop, came in and she preached about stretching forward towards our goals and that how we are called to continue to journey towards Christ. Um, And today, I'm going to wrap up our sermon series. And, well, the truth is, the Olympics are over. And if you've been crying a little bit, as I have, it's okay. Um, But the Olympics are are over. If you Maybe you've grabbed the remote to turn it on and you realize that it's just good old daytime TV. Woo. Anyways. Um, and then, or the memory of Michael Phelps and Kayla Desi, you know, the great swimmers that, that, bre- that broke records and got gold is over, you know, or the medals. Man, I got to look it up here. The medals, 121 medals that Team USA got and 46 of them being gold medals. All of those great memories are already starting to fade. You know, the truth is, is using this idea of living the Olympic life, it was great inspiration for us to journey on towards Christ. But in that same idea, the medals have been won. The confetti has fallen. The excitement is over. Now what? Now what do we do? Well, in 1994, a movie came out that a few of you may, have know, may know about. Um, the title is uh, Forrest Gump. Okay, yes, uh, you're laughing, so I'm going to take that as yes, you've heard of such a movie. Okay, very good. Small little movie, made a little bit of money, but yes, Forrest Gump came out, and um, you know, there's a lot of, everybody knows this one, it's still quoted to this day. There's a lot of memory that my mom and dad, they love that movie because it brings back so much memories for them. I'll leave that alone and move on. And, um, and when there's a scene in that movie, Forrest Gump, where Forrest just starts running. Do you guys know that scene? He just starts walking and running, and they're like, well, why do you run all the time? He's like, I don't run all the time. I walk when I want to, and I do, do whatever. Well, that scene was based on Peter Jenkins' life. Peter Jenkins wrote the best-selling uh, 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 book called Walk Across America. And Peter Jenkins, he started walking just simply because he wanted to find himself out. Like a lot of people that walk the Appalachian Trail or whatever, he was just trying to discover himself and figure out what life is about. And one thing that he did not expect to find on this walk was faith. And he found faith. And Peter, puts it, Peter Jenkins puts it this way. He was walking in Alabama. And that's a, I'll, I'll leave it alone, but I love doing that, that slang. Alabama. He was in Alabama. Uh, okay, that may be the last time. He was there. <laughs> I'm sorry, I love southern accents. Um, so he was there. And he was walking by, and there was a great revival going on. And he was curious. Curiosity got the best of him, and he walked up, and the words that were shared, the music that was shared, it grabbed a hold of him, and he stirred, and when the altar call, when the call to come forward and proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and ask for forgiveness, he came forward. And he was overwhelmed with emotion and feelings of elation, of excitement, of goodness. And he couldn't help it. And he was just, woohoo! And people were patting him back on his back and said, you were saved. God brought you here. My favorite one, ain't God good? You know, all these great things. And it, it's quoted in his book. You can look it up. So, uh, <laughs> I, uh, so all these great elations were happening once he came forward. But then Mary came forward. Mary put her hand on Peter Jenkins' back and says, you're feeling great elations, aren't you? And he said, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. And she's like, well, I'm so glad. But I need you to know that feelings and faith are not intertwined. Ooh. And Peter, I, 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 I hope this lasts long for you, but you need to know this will not last forever. Peter Jenkins' quote is saying, I didn't really care what what that woman's opinions had to say. All I knew is that because of my faith, I was feeling great, and that's all that matters. And he goes on to say is that, yes, I've had a, and if you guys know this term, mountaintop experiences, right? He's had a lot of high experiences in his life, and he even says that he's probably had more higher experiences than probably most people. But with that said, 
he said that there has been some valleys that not only has he tried to get out of, but he's had to crawl out of. So he, he knew very well. He knows very well over the 20 plus years of that revival story of that, yes, God is good, but there's difficult times in this life. And I love this story, and I'm so glad that I ran across Peter Jenkins' story um, this week because I think for us, it's our story that if you have proclaimed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you've experienced highs and lows, and you've experienced mountaintop moments. Now, I use this term mountaintop moments, and you may wonder, where does this come from? It comes from right here. The best, there's two mountaintop experience scriptures that I want to share with you. The first one is, is Moses. Moses gets to go up on the mountain, and it is, it is uh, overwhelmed with a cloud, with lightning and thunder, and he's in the presence of God. It's pretty amazing. And the experience with God is so amazing that he comes down that people are frightened because his head is glowing so much. Pretty awesome stuff in the presence of, that is the mountaintop experience. But there's another mountaintop experience I want to share with you that involves Jesus, the Son of God. It involves two long dead people and involves three people that are scared out of their wits. All right, so we're going to be, uh, our scripture for reflection today is Luke chapter 9, uh, verse 28. And again, um, if, you, if you feel comfortable uh, in reading any way you want. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And some of you may know the story is the Transfiguration. So let us hear now the Word of God. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took uh, with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were, were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make the three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And not knowing what he said. Now while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they came as they were terrified. They were terrified as they entered the cloud, excuse me. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, "This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him." When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Wow. I mean, there's all these shows and sci-fi things about people being able to travel back in time. Wouldn't you love to have been there? To experience the transfiguration, the, the presence of God, to be on that mountaintop. Mm, it would have been amazing. But before we go to the mountaintop, I want to give some context. Jesus had just told the disciples, hey guys, remember that long, really, they're taking a long time to get to Jerusalem. Remember this long walk we're taking to get to Jerusalem? Well, on my way there, when I get there, oh, I forgot to mention this. Okay, let me go ahead and tell you. When I get there, I'm going to be beaten, persecuted, and killed. Now for us, it's an age-old story, and we're like, yeah, we know this has to happen to our Savior. We get it. But to the disciples, they've given up everything. They've given up their family. They've given up their friends. They've given up their livelihood. They've given up what used to be their lives to follow this man for three years. And they thought this man was going to be the resurrection and the life and that there was going to be no more death, that there was going to be no more sin, and that they were going to have life ever after. And now the guy that they followed for three years is going to die. I can't imagine how they were feeling. And then as, as Pastor Frank would say, Jesus is about to give them all that and a bag of chips. 
He says, come on, disciples, I want to take you up on this mountain. And all of a sudden, he is transfigured into a, a holy moment in which Moses, the one that represents the law, the law is coming to fruition through Jesus. Elijah, the great prophets being represented that said Jesus is coming, that the great Messiah is coming, they show up. And sure, the disciples don't know what they're saying, but they don't need to. They know it's holy. And I'll get back to Peter wanting to do the dwelling places in just a minute. They know it's holy. And then I can just imagine them. See, they're about to fall asleep. Remember that in the story? They were so tired, they were about to, they were about to miss all of it. And I could just imagine, this is a holy imagination, okay? That God goes, oh, they might think this is a dream. I better make this real for them. And God goes all around them and says, this is my son, listen up. <laughs> oh, Okay, so for that moment, the disciples knew that that moment was not only amazing, not only was it a mountaintop experience, but it was holy. It was set apart. It was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that they will never have again. But then just like Peter, he blurts out the fast-talking Peter, right? The one that wants to be, you know, we call it brown-nosing, which I'll leave that alone because that's a really, ugh, we'll leave that alone. But he's the one that's wanting to really be like, oh, look at me. And he goes, oh, Jesus, this is amazing. Let's make three dwelling places so this will never end. But just like Peter, we grab on to these holy moments in our lives, and we don't want to let them go. And we hold on to them, and we, just like Peter, we say, let's make three dwelling places. But Jesus says, oh, you got to let it go, and we got to move on. And you see, we can't stay on the mountaintop. And if you've ever climbed a mountain or, or know anything about mountains on the top, there's not a lot of things that can sustain us. The air is thin. The rocks are plentiful. And the water, well, sometimes there's just not any up there. To be able to live the life of, of sustenance, to, li to live, we must go down the valley into the plentiful, we must go down the mountain into the plentiful valleys where the water, where the animals, and where the plants are there to sustain us. And that's it, my friends. We want to be like Peter, and we want to hold on to these moments. And just like the gold and the moments, yeah, I, can, I couldn't imagine an Olympian that got gold and how excited they feel, but then they have to come back after all that training and all that experience, and they have to go back into the world. That, it's, it, that was all exciting, but now just like Peter, now what? That was so amazing, nothing's going to be like that way. What do I do now? Well, friends, our calling is to live in the valleys, and sometimes it is difficult, and sometimes it's hard. But Jesus, you know, this transfiguration, this still isn't what Jesus was all about. This isn't why the disciples followed Jesus. They followed Jesus for the three years of companionship that they had with him. They followed Jesus because they knew that there was life everlasting, and that they knew they couldn't get that anywhere else. And my friends, that's why we follow Jesus. Yes, there's going to be mountaintop experiences when we say, yes, Jesus, you, I want you. And then we're sustained by that promise and by that covenant. But then valleys come, and God leads us through the valleys, all the way up to the point on Calvary's Hill, Calvary's Hill, in which he was crucified, dead, and buried, and then was risen from the dead. Why? For us. I don't understand it, but it's for us, for all of us. And God says, I want you to follow me. Why? Because I will bring you joy. I will bring you peace. I will bring you a life that you cannot imagine. Yes, life will be difficult, but you will never be left alone. Do you get it yet? Did you hear it this morning? Faithful disciples of Jesus is our calling. And the truth is, I don't know if, all, if everyone here has proclaimed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and I don't know how far we've wandered off our journey towards Christ. But I'm going to offer a prayer. Some people call it sinner's prayer, some people call it the salvation prayer, and some people call it I need you prayer. <laughs> and I'm going to offer that prayer to you, and if you would like, you can lift your hand as much as this, you can lift your hand all the way up, but I'm just asking you to prostrate yourself up in, in such a way, I guess I use oxymoron, but put your hand up in such a way that you're opening yourself to God. It can be like this, it can be up as many ways you want, and I'm going to offer a prayer that will be a prayer for us to recommit our lives and to follow Christ. So let us pray now. Come, Lord Jesus, come. 
Come and fill our hearts. Lord, on this day we confess that we have not followed you faithfully. (laughs) It hurts to say it out loud, Lord, but it's true. We failed. We have sinned which simply means that we've let things get in the way of our relationship with you, Lord. And we ask not only for your forgiveness, Lord, because we know you offer that. We don't understand it, but we thank you for it, Lord. But we ask for not only our, for your forgiveness, Lord, but for your guidance in our life so that we can turn away from that, we can repent, that we can be faithful disciples in your name, Lord. And Lord, if there are people here that have never proclaimed you as their Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that you would work on their hearts that you would help them, give them the courage to say, Lord, I want you to be the Lord over my life, that I want you to be my Messiah, that I want you to be the one that will resurrect me, O Lord, and to ask for the forgiveness of their sins. Lord, if there's anyone that's doing that today, I praise high praise for them, and I pray that you continue to work in their lives and that your Holy Spirit will be with them. And for those that are recommitting their lives to you, Lord, I give such high praise as well, Lord, because they realize the need that they have in you and the desires they have in their lives. So that's simple, Lord. That's it. We ask that you continue to work within our lives, that your Holy Spirit would anoint us afresh this day, and that we may be able to go out and be the hands and feet and the disciples that you called us to be. So Lord, hear our prayers. And it's in your name we pray. Amen and amen.